Good evening, everyone. Hi, this is Sherry Sims, and welcome to our first edition of The Corner Office. And for those of you who are uh, new to uh, BCWN in terms of watching our uh, Google Hangouts, we typically do what we call the career conversations. The career conversations is where we uh, have a guest on and we talk about topics that affect African American women in the workplace. But we're doing something different with this new segment, The Corner Office. The Corner Office is going to be all about leadership. And the women that we're going to have on these corner office segments are going to be women who are in leadership roles, uh, specifically African-American women who are going to be sharing their lessons they've learned, the triumphs and challenges, and giving advice on how um, to help you to grow and become the leader that you were born to be. So I'm so excited about our guest tonight. Her name is Dr. Avis Jones DeWeaver, and she is the author of like, How Exceptional Black Women Lead. It's a book. Show your book, Ms. Dr. Avis. Show your book. Show your book. <laughs> It's so right here. <laughs> All right. So I'm so excited to have her on. But before we get started, I wanted to share some things about uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Avis Jones the Weaver um, before we get started into this conversation. So this is one conversation that we, we've already said this before we went on the air that we know we're going to continue with because this is so much to cover when it comes to leadership in black women. So just to dive in and kind of share some things about Dr. Avis. Uh, she is a career reinvention strategist, a diversity consultant, and a women's empowerment expert. She's the author of, of course, How Exceptional Black Women Lead, and the founder of Exceptional Leadership Institute for Women, a global personal and professional development firm that helps establish and aspire entrepreneurs and executives to experience accelerated success while building holistic life that they love. Dr. Avis formerly served as the youngest ever executive director of the National Council of Negro Women. It's a historical membership organization that touches the lives of over 4 million women of African descent nationwide, or worldwide, should I say. She has, she's, she's had the honor of being the keynote speaker to the inaugural President of the United States Young African Leaders Summit and was a featured speaker before the World Bank. She is currently she currently conducts workshops and trainings on women's careers and entrepreneurial success on the behalf of the U.S. embassies across the globe and helps corporations better design and implement strategies to maximize the power of diversity and inclusion at work as well as fully take advantage of opportunities within diverse markets for today and tomorrow. So for individuals, Dr. Avis, she coaches one-on-one -on -one in small groups, online and offers online courses in order to help her clients master the art of the career shift. I hope we get to talk about that a little bit because that's Absolutely. important as well. <laughs> Absolutely. And so she helps women uh, shift their careers in three distinct areas. One, ascending the leadership within the current professional space. Two, safely and effectively transitioning to a new career. Three, making the ultimate shift from employee to successful entrepreneur, which are three key areas that a lot of us as African-American women are really concerned about in our careers. So you can find Dr. Avis regularly. Can, 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 I, can't, I can't talk this evening. <laughs> Contributor. <Okay. laughs> we always have to laugh at you on these, of course. You can find her regularly as a contributor on TV One's, TV One's News One Now with Roland Martin, for those of you who are familiar with uh, Roland Martin, uh, PBS To The Contrary, um, also on Cyrus XM Radio, The Agenda, and Huffington Post. So you can also go to her website at avisjonesdeweaver.com, and we'll talk about how you can find her later on in the segment. So I just wanted to share that with you guys, and welcome, Dr. Amos, to the to the corner office. Thank you for launching our first segment. Thanks for giving me the honor to launch your first segment of the corner office. I'm excited to be here. I am excited too. So for those of you who are just now uh, jumping on again, this is our new uh, this is our new series called the Corner Office, and it's all about leadership and how we as African-American women need to be looking at grooming ourselves for leadership and all the things that come along with that. And of course, our table is going to share some of her journey as well. So let's dive right in. Let's talk about this book. <laughs> yes, yes. This was my passion project for like over two years. So I'm glad that it's out and in the universe. I'm so glad. So, you know, for those of you, I got the book on Kindle. When we did our career conversation last week, I showed my, I showed my iPad with, the, with it on there. And I, I definitely, <laughs> 
a must read book. It's one that if you do not have this in your library, women, you need to get this book because it's, it's not just about leadership. It's about you being aware of who you are in the workplace overall and, and how much value you bring to that. And not, not diminishing your own light. There's so many segments to this book that I think is so relevant that I just, I'm excited. I wish we could just do a chapter per day and just <laughs> one. Wait a minute. That's not a bad idea there, Sherry. It really is not. I was like, I'm so, I was sitting up thinking about ways to brainstorm to bring it back. <laughs> <laughs> oh my so God. I'm so excited. So I'm going to, I know that when I shared the promo out with everyone today, we did have a couple of bullet points um, yeah. in here that we want to cover. So I'm going to pull those up really quick. And so yeah. we can start kind of covering those. But while mm -hmm. I pull those up, is there anything specific you want to share um, in addition to what we, your bio that I read, um, do you want to share with the viewers? Sure. I mean, you know, I am really focused on having black women create is, I just want to emphasize the fact that it's important that we create a holistic life that we love. I mean, we work, black women have always worked clearly in this uh, nation. We've never really needed a women's movement to inject us in the workforce. We've been here from the beginning, right? Um, yeah. But with, through that sort of uh, focus on work, sometimes we get sort of lost in terms of really having a specific focus or at least an analogous focus on the rest of our lives. And so it's important for me that we focus not only on being successful in our careers, but also building a home life that we love to, because, you know, it's, it's two sides of one coin and we need to make the most of this life. Yes, we do. And I think balance is something that we definitely need that we, some of us are great at it and others are not, and some of us are still working on that. So I think that this, this, we're going we're gonna to cover that. So I've got the points up here. And I, some of the things that, that I shared in the promo today was talking about whether you're in corporate America or whether you're an entrepreneur, you know, that we're all natural, natural leaders or born leaders. And I know you stated that in part of what the, um, the very beginning of your book and I wanted to make sure I shared that piece because yeah. I want women to understand that they aren't they are born we are black women we are born leaders um, you know based on what we what we deal with and how we go about um, you know developing ourselves and growing within our culture so elaborate a little bit on that before we really kind of dive into some some of the other pieces of what you want them to learn Absolutely. So I, I definitely start the book by making just the definitive statement that black women are born leaders and I truly believe that if you look at even a cursory glance of our history in terms of all that we have faced, particularly in this country, uh, if we were not, we would not have survived, I believe, through everything that we have survived as a nation. We were critical contributors to all the major social movements uh, that have led to at least the level of freedom that we have today, not only as black people, but as women. Uh, even though oftentimes we haven't been given the official title of leaders, we have been the ones uh, consistently who have done the work in the civil rights movement and the women's rights movement, even today in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement, mm -hmm. it's women who are who's leading that movement, right? And so, uh, you know, to me, leadership is really injected into our DNA. And besides uh, movement building, if you look at what we do in our communities, uh, we tend to be the leaders, the workers in our churches. We tend to be the leaders, the workers in our community organizations. I mean, the Black community, quite frankly, and this nation would not be the same if it were not for the contributions of Black women. So I just want us to recognize that we're not talking about uh, doing something that we don't do every day. What we're talking about here is really getting the recognition that we deserve and getting the specific positions and the analogous compensation for that position, those positions that we deserve so that our natural leadership abilities are recognized and given the ability to shine. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I would deny, and so in, in other words, you know, let's, let's kind of point out what are some of the things that the women can think about in terms of, because we may, we may have someone who's watching right now saying, you know what, I, I don't really see myself as a leader or they may not recognize some of the things that they do that show natural leadership ability. So can you maybe name a few things that they can recognize about themselves and say, oh, okay, well, then that, that is showing leadership. Absolutely. So are you someone who is like a, uh, a classroom mom for your child's classroom? Are you someone who's actively involved in the PTA? Are you someone who uh, leads uh, so Bible study, you know, at your church? Are you someone who leads 
Sunday school at your church? Uh, are you a choir leader? Are you someone who's involved in a sorority or some other community service organization? Are you leading in that capacity in terms of community service projects and things of that nature? You know, these are things that we do almost automatically and we don't, may, we might not contextualize them as leadership, but the reality is that gives you the experience of leading something, developing a concept, putting together a team, uh, having goals, timetables, responsibilities associated with implementing that plan, and then having outcomes as a result of those efforts. That's basically what leadership is. And we do it all the time. Uh, there's in fact been research, um, survey research that suggests that black women are more likely to have leadership experience in, in all of these areas uh, than other women. And so we are in fact more likely to lead in every aspect of life than our counterparts across other racial categories. But when it comes to the workplace, we're oftentimes looked over even though we generally have more leadership experience. So it's really about owning the fact that this isn't anything new. It's definitely something that's within our capabilities. It's something that we do all the time and we can just apply those same skills to the workforce. Yeah, I love that, I love that. And so for those of you who are viewing tonight, um, we do have a Q&A box that we have that's up. So if, you are, if you're in the Google Hangout and you have some questions that you wanna ask Dr. Avis, you can type them in the question box. Or if you're watching live from our website, um, hopefully you're on the, our, our BCW uh, network.com backslash the hyphen corner hyphen office. And that's the web, the link. So if you're, if you're in the, if you're in the uh, career conversations, you're in the wrong one, <laughs> just so you'll know. <laughs> But you can also ask your questions via Twitter or also in our Facebook group. You have some questions for Dr. Ava. So please, please ask her away. This is the best time to do that. So let's jump right into some of the some of the things that you want to share. Key, you know, key components of the things you want to to the viewers to, to learn um, right. tonight. And let's talk about the first one, which is why now is the optimal time for increased representation of black women within leadership positions mm -hmm. and what it will take for us both individually and collectively to get there now before you kind of go into that the one thing i wanted to share i know you've seen you know the some of the statistics that have been out there about you know um there was one particular um report that was done by a caucasian woman about you know lack of leadership of, of you know black women in the you know in you know C-suite roles or higher level roles, um, just wanted to kind of kind of put that out there in terms of you know why you think that they they felt it necessary to um, you know to do a report as such, and then also again going back to your question is that you know what can they do to get there? Yeah. What can black people do to get there? Yeah, well, um, you know, sort of the background in terms of why now is the time, it's almost like, a, you know, a perfect storm of, 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 of factors are coming together for us right now. Uh, we are at a demographic tipping point in this nation uh, in less than, uh, in a little bit more than a generation's time, so around 30 years or so from now, uh, this nation will no longer be a majority white nation. It will be a nation that is made up of a majority of people of color. At the same time, if you look worldwide at the fastest growing economies, uh, 10 of the world's the fastest growing economies are based on the African continent. Uh, in addition to that, we have an increased focus on women's empowerment, not only here uh, in, the, in this nation, but really across the world in a variety of circumstances. Um, and so when you put together those three factors, uh, the browning of America, uh, the rise of Africa, and the increased focus on uh, women's empowerment, we really find ourselves at a moment in time in which the specific experiences and the specific ex um, perspectives of Black women are particularly in tune to these various factors. And so it creates a situation where I believe our particular perspective are primed, is primed for the world of the future and the world of today. Um, but it doesn't mean those doors are going to open up naturally to us, right? We've always had to bust through those doors. And so that's why we need to work um, both individually and collectively to get there. Now, in terms of how we do that first individually, it's really about preparing, which we're doing already. We're among the most uh, educated group demographic in America, and we continue to rise in that, in that respect. Uh, we are the most dedicated uh, group of women to the workforce. We have the highest labor force participation of any women in America and have always done sport, so. Uh, we have the greatest level of ambition when it comes to um, our, our careers. And so we're already there in terms of wanting to do well and wanting to get that promotion and wanting to lead. The problem is what's, where's the disconnect? So the disconnect is that those doors don't oftentimes open for us. And so what I believe we need to do collectively 
is to really make a concerted effort uh, to push for the expansion of leadership opportunities for black women specifically, instead of only pushing for the expansion of opportunities for women in the abstract. Because typically what happens is when we push for and join together, I mean, I know it sounds very kumbaya-ish and we've tried to, you know, we've done this coalition thing forever and it's good for in a lot of circumstances, right? But right. the reality is that when we push for the women's empowerment in the, in the, in the abstract, what actually happens in practice is that white women typically take up almost the entire amount of the spoils. And so that's how you end up in a situation where, you know, out of in the entire history of the Fortune 500, you've only had 15 black CEOs, but, and only one of them has been a black woman, and now she's no longer, you know, the CEO, so a CEO. So we have zero um, black women uh, at the moment as a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. And so we need to start being very specific in our um, advocacy and in our, in our efforts to push towards leadership for black women specifically and not just women in general. And then when we find ourselves in positions of power, like uh, on boards of directors or like in higher level senior positions within organizations, we need to be very specific about mentoring and sponsoring each other so that we can ascend up that ladder very specifically and not just try to be some, you know, a, a group that's not specifically interested in making sure that we have our own advancement. Because it's my belief that if we don't push for our own advancement, it's hard to expect that other people will do it for us. Right. So let's kind of dive off into that because, you know, we're talking about individually and in a collective. What can mm -hmm. someone as an individual, you know, the viewers are watching and maybe asking this question to themselves right now, you know, yeah. individually, what should they be doing or considering first? What should be their first move, their first yeah. task? Or, you know, what should be the first thing they should be putting in place to create that movement for themselves? Right. So the very first thing you have to do is get together your career plan. I mean, uh, success is not something that just is bestowed upon you. <laughs> it's something that has to be actively. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Sorry about that. Are you still there? Oh, you're okay. Okay, sorry about that. I've had my, I've had my dog bark before. I wanted these to reply. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm on a Mac, and you know, when I get a phone call, it comes right through the computer. So my apologies. Okay. Um, but what I was saying was that you know we have to, you, the fir very first part of that problem is that you have to put together your own career plan. You have to be very strategic about it and know exactly first of all what you want your ultimate goal to be, your your leadership role that you're aspiring to. Figure out who who's been there, done that. Uh, don't reinvent the wheel, basically. Look and see what they've done, and to the best of your ability, try to mirror those specific actions. Everything from the credentials to the experiences uh, to the actual, uh, to the to the degree that you can, similar mentors and similar sponsors that you can formulate relationship with, relationships with, similar networks. All of those things will be helpful for you. I have an example of a woman in my book who uh, is currently the CEO of Metric Stream, a, a firm out in uh, Silicon Valley. But when she started her career, she ultimately she initially wanted to be the, the uh, CEO of IBM. She knew she wanted to be a CEO. So she said, the first thing I need to do is I need to get a degree from a top business school. And she decided that if she applied to Wharton, as an undergraduate that it would save her time because she wouldn't necessarily need an MBA there. She could just get her bachelor's degree and start her career. She applied to Wharton, she got in and it was a successful strategy. She got into IBM, did very well. Make a long story short, she initially, she, at, the, at the end of the day, she ultimately became the highest black woman in the organization, uh, op operating over a billion dollars uh, budget that she was overseeing, but decided that she wanted to shift gears and become a CEO of a smaller company. Uh, actually did the same thing, planned exactly how to do, do that and implemented that well. The point is each and every step along the way, she developed her own career map and implemented. So the most important thing, for the first step that you can take is figure out exactly what you wanna do and how you wanna do it strategically and then go about implementing that plan. Success isn't accidental, success uh, comes as a result of plans and implementation. Right, and so we talk about that a lot in terms of being very strategic with the plan, right? Um, and so what happens when you, you have this plan in place and then, which kind of goes into your second one, which is the advice on how to communicate power uh, without yeah. being labeled as the angry black woman. So what about when things kind of get ajar, you know, they don't go as planned and, and, you know, yes, you're being strategic, but of course something's been thrown into the program, it's kind of throwing you off a little bit. 
you know, so how do how do they deal with how do they deal with the challenges that comes about from that? Absolutely. Well, that's a very good point because you know no one's plan is going to be implemented without a hitch. I mean, unexpected things happen, and so you just have to understand that sometimes you might have to shift your goals. Sometimes you might have to recalibrate. Sometimes you might have to take take a step or two back or a step or two to the side and then uh, redevelop that plan and move forward in a different direction. But the point is to know that you have to take that time to step off, figure it out your next go round and then implement. Now there may be opportunities or uh, um, issues that may occur, as you mentioned, that might um, cause you to have to be very uh, stern in terms of dealing with certain situations. And the reality is that as a leader, you have to be able to give instructions. Uh, you have to be able to expect a level of accountability from the team that you're leading. Uh, and so those are things that are absolutely necessary in order for you to get the results that you need to get. Uh, you are going to be judged by results, just like anybody else is going to be judged by results. And so you need to be able to uh, understand how to lead in a way in which you will get respect and which people will also deliver when they're supposed to deliver so that everybody looks good, including you. The challenge that we face, though, as African-American women, as you know, we all know, there are unfair stereotypes out there about who we are. And unfortunately... Right. For a lot of folks who have no other introduction to black women other than all the ridiculousness that they see on TV and all these reality shows, yeah. I mean, that's their conception of who we are. We know that's not who we are, but if they don't have any other actions, interactions with black women besides what they see on TV, that's their stereotype, that's their belief, all right? And so how do we counteract the problem that we then face in terms of uh, holding people accountable, in terms of expressing frustration when we have a right to express frustration or just plain just being very stern in the directions that we give. Um, really, the suggestions around there are a couple fold. Number one, we need to be very, very in control of our tone and of our facial expressions when we're communicating. Uh, those two things go a long way. Uh, I don't believe you should uh, sort of hold back in terms of not saying what needs to be said. Of course, it makes a big difference in how you say it. You can be very direct. You can be very stern. You don't have to be disrespectful, but you can be very direct and stern. But say it in such a way uh, that you have control over your voice. You're not yelling. You're not um, raising your voice in any way. And that it's very... Um, you, you know, it, it is it is very powerful in terms of how you say it. Okay, don't diminish it. Don't finish your sentences in the form of a question like, "Would you like to do that?" You know, that's just not that's not going to elicit respect, right? So just be very <laughs> stern, but be very um, purposeful in how you state what you're going to say. Say, um, look people in the eye. Don't be demure when it comes to that, but also. Don't, you know, roll your eyes. Don't sort of uh, diminish yourself down to that level. So communicate with power, uh, but do so in a way in which is professional at all times. Because once you do uh, lose your temper, people stop listening. They shut down. Uh, you lose a level of respect. If you're in a situation where your temper is raised, sometimes it's best just to take a minute and take a few breaths step away, recompose your thoughts, and then come back to that situation where you can handle it in a more professional manner because you're not going to be judged the same way if you lose your temper than maybe your colleague would who is not a black woman uh, in if they were to lose their temper. We're just held to different standards, and it's not fair, but it's the truth. Right. It's, it's a, it definitely is the truth, and I love what you said about communicating with power. So for those of you who are viewers who are listening, write that down somewhere communicate with power i think that statement by itself says a lot um, yeah. and i know that you know we we tend to wear our emotions on, the sleeve, on our sleeves a lot of us do yeah like you see those facial expressions or if someone says something kind of crazy we just we just have this look right <laughs> because we, just, we do we have this look and i and i loved that you brought up the fact about the stereotypes because we, we talk about this a lot in our career conversations and our real career talk calls about um the stereotypes mm -hmm. and how how when we're in the workplace, you know, we they're, they're placed upon us either consciously or subconsciously by by other people. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we sometimes go to work and have to undo the stereotype. And we shouldn't have to juggle that in addition to everything else of you know working twice as good and you know, being twice mm -hmm. as good as they are. Um, and all the and our communication style, making sure we're not doing the faces and the expressions. Right. And then have also, in addition to, have to be very conscious and mindful of, you know, um, that we have to kind of 
like in a way subconsciously prove that we're not the stereotype they think we are and we shouldn't have to do that you know i was talking about we should go into the workplace and it's about you know me as a person and not me as a black woman having to deal with that absolutely i'm glad glad you talked about that and so let's kind of break it down a little bit more in terms of the stereotype piece in Mm -hmm. and we're going into the workplace it is when it's put on it when we are subconsciously going in and having to do the shifting piece mm-hmm. where, we're, where we're going in, we're, we're talking a certain way and we're, we're, you know, we wear our hair a certain way because we don't want to be, or we're trying not to be um, stereotyped. And mm-hmm. I was watching a show earlier today that comes on, um, I think it's Centric or BET and it's about curvy style. And it was one lady who's a political, um, she's not an activist, but she's, she's I think she uses pol- political strategic something. Mm-hmm. She was mm-hmm. beautiful black woman. And um, she's a curvy girl, mm-hmm. but she, you know, she really was um, very upset that she had to change her style. And mm-hmm. the first thing that came out of her mouth was, I've been very mindful about my appearance and how I walk, how I talk, how I carry myself, because I didn't want to be stereotyped a certain way. And mm-hmm. I thought, oh my goodness, I got to talk about that on tonight's yeah. <laughs> her office. Um, and then with her being in, um, in, in, you know, in DC around the political arena, you know, she was very adamant about not relinquishing that control, um, and being very, uh, mindful of her image. Mm-hmm. What happened when we put too much emphasis on that? What does it do to the perception that we're putting out in the work in the workplace when we try to hold on to that, um, and, and focus on that too much? Yeah. I, you know, I don't want people to feel like you are responsible for other people's ignorance because you're not. Okay. Yeah. You're not responsible for another person's closed mindedness. There are some people who are just going to be ignorant no matter what you do. Right. However, um, there are different cultures depending upon what work environment that you're in also. So for example, uh, a corporate environment might require a different wardrobe, for example, than a nonprofit environment. So there, there, it, it, you know, so, it, you know, you may have to wear quote unquote, the uniform. If you're in a corporate environment, dark suits or whatever might be the norm. And you just have to kind of mirror what's the norm, uh, in that particular instance. Um, but it's not to, you, you, you can have some, um, areas where you can have some level of individuality. So for example, if you, know that you're not really feeling all the dark suits if you're in law or if you're in the corporate world you know maybe you can have a a little bit of a a bright color to your purse or something like that if that's going to make you feel like you are you know allowing a little bit of your individuality to shine through but you're still conforming to the overall corporate culture um in terms of um the the hair thing it's very controversial you know obviously i kind of uh <laughs> much that. You know, I've been having my locks for about 20 years now. I, you know, I, I'm believing, I'm hoping, and I'm seeing evidence uh, that the world is expanding their mind because my my personal belief on this, and I see you have beautiful natural hair here as well, is that you know if someone is more concerned with what's on my head instead of what's in my head, then that tells me that's probably some place where I would want to work anyway. It tells me something about the limited mindset of that institution, of the culture of that organization. So I've always seen that as, quite frankly, this as a pr- protective factor for me uh, in order to uh, help me understand those spaces that I probably wouldn't want to be and wouldn't want to spend my time. Uh, and so, you know, it, those things are important. but. The biggest way I believe to sort of break beyond break beyond these stereotypes is just to perform. I mean, that is the bottom line. If you are in sales and you're the top salesperson, nobody cares what your hair looks like, you know, and within reason, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? So just perform, outperform them. And we have the ability to do that. So uh, focus on your performance. Definitely to a certain extent, you're gonna want to be within the boundaries of the cultural norms of the space that you're working in. But you know, right. if you are a top performer, you're going to get a lot more leeway uh, and you'll have the ability to at least express your individuality at some, in some level uh, so that you won't feel like you're, you're completely disassociating yourself from what you believe is important to you in terms of expressing your culture. Now, and, and, and we and, and that makes a very good point. Cause I know I talked about that before in one of the articles I had written about you know, looking at what is the, what is, you know, what is the company's image? What do they want 
to be conveyed and then finding a balance like you said finding mm -hmm. a balance in between the two um so you can feel more of, of yourself too absolutely the one, thing, the one thing i want to ask you though is when it comes to um performing right because there's some women who say i just want to you know do my job and be good at it and that's going to be enough and go home right <laughs> what do you say because i know you've heard no, this <laughs> We're just that easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have to touch base on this because we do have some who think that's just enough. The, yeah. I, and I know that performing and outperforming or being very good at that is great. And like you said, making sure that you are within the norms of the organization, which is a key as well. Right. But what are the things that are important too to create? It just can't be just being a great performer alone that's going to that's going to create this. You know, help you to get to you know go up that ladder the way you want to, or at least meet your goals in, in your career plan. In addition to that, what else do they need to know? I don't want to say because I know you know. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, absolutely. I mean, as black women, we we don't you know we we know about performing well. We know about working. We work hard, right? And we've also, unfortunately, uh, oftentimes had the experiences, I'm sure many of us have, of working really hard, being a top performer, and then seeing, you know, Bobby Joe over there leapfrog over us, and they get the promotion, and they get credit for all the great work that we've done. We, You know, many of us have had those experiences over and over again. So, you yes. know, the point is that doing well and being a hard worker and producing results isn't enough if other people don't know that you're the one doing it or if you're not being uh, given the credit for having done that. So in addition to overperforming, you also need to understand how to self-promote. You need to make sure that you understand how to communicate that you are responsible for the outcomes that are producing great results for the company because if you don't step up and make sure, and it is, you know, I'm not saying be, you know, overly verbose about it, but just make sure that the right people know that credit is needs to come to you. If you don't, aren't assuming credit for your, all of your great work, then don't be surprised when someone else takes credit for it and gets the spoils as a result. So for the viewers who are watching who may have this question, how do they self-promote? Where do they start? And whom do they start with to make, make sure who are the key people they need to communicate this to to recognize the level of work that they're doing or what they're accomplishing? Yeah, so this is where having that network comes into play really strongly. And, and uh, this the, the particular layer of the network that I'm talking about here is your sort of home base. So you need to make sure that your supervisor knows other sort of mentors that you might have within the organization, that you're staying in contact with folks to let people know what you're doing, what your accomplishments are, what your goals are, so they can help you along the way. And that that way, even if you're not the one who's, for example, letting the gatekeepers know what you're doing, if your mentor knows that you're responsible for uh, X, Y, Z happening, then when opportunities come up, then you are, then your name is passed on as it should be, rather than somebody else sort of taking advantage of those opportunities instead of you. So you need to make sure that your your network is really, really tight there. Your immediate supervisor, as well as other mentors within the organization that can and sponsors that can make sure that you get credit where credit's due. Okay, good. So my question to you is I some you know, I often share with women the network of some of our calls, even some of the career conversations I talk about if someone's new going into an organization some of the things they need to be identifying early on once they start, not just going in and identifying, we, you know what you're going to have to go in and do specific things and perform. Right. We're talking about what are some of the things they need to identify with fairly quickly, um, mm -hmm. you know, to really kind of help them to, uh, you know, adapt a little faster to the, to the, um, you know, to the environment to, and, and making sure that, they recognize early on that this this job is is in it. well they should know beforehand but the organization overall it definitely will be able to will help them or benefit from the career plan they have you know in place yeah good question so what's really important for people to do is and this is this is really a good sort of uh, tidbit of information a lot of the information that you'll need to get to be able to get that uh, those golden nuggets is not going to be the type of information that's normally given over the coffee, you know, over the water cooler or in the morning getting coffee, right? A lot of times those things come from very informal conversations. So this is why it's so important to uh, go out with your colleagues, whether or not you want to. <laughs> yes. Afterwards. Yes. 
Can you say it again, Dr. Amos? <laughs> Whether or not you want to, you might be like, I don't want to see these folks no more. I'm ready to yeah. get out of here and bolt, you know, but for your own future well-being, trust me, it's worth the investment to go to happy hours with your colleagues when they're yep. in a more relaxed environment, they're a little bit more loose, they're, they're more likely to talk more informally. Uh, one of the women in my book, she's a VP at IBM, she talked about her experiences during this sort of happy hour period with her colleagues. That's where she found out whether or not she was being paid fairly. That's where she found out what the good assignments were and what the bad assignments were. That's where she found out exactly who she needed to connect with in, in order to be able to ascend up the career ladder a little bit faster. Those are the spaces where you'll get those informal conversations, those, those golden nuggets that you're not necessarily going to get around the conference room table. So you have to, you know, get out of the office sometimes to get some of the critical information that you'll need to be able to advance in the office. Now, I, I, I'm going to have to put some emphasis on this for you viewers. What she just shared with you guys was that was a, a golden nugget of wisdom. I mean, if you are sitting here thinking that you don't want to do the after hours events and things like that with your with your coworkers, you know, now she's giving you some insight as to the importance of why. Mm -hmm. The importance of what you can find out in a more yeah. relaxed environment. <laughs> yeah. so, you know, so make note of that, viewers, that, you know, it's important that that's what you're going to find out about specific things that can help you to get an edge over being able to navigate the workplace and achieve your goals, whether it's a promotion, um, whatever it may be. So yeah. just, you know, learning how to, to benefit from um, being in that environment after hours and, and how important it can be to, you know, your your development or where you the trajectory you want to create within that organization. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. So I want to talk real quick. This is kind of a, a good segue into this, which is specifically about how to deal with unfairness, no matter what form it takes, and, mm -hmm. in, and pushing through that anyway. Yeah. Um, share with us what you mean by that. Sure. So that's the most. That's one of the most uncomfortable situations that uh, we went through in the book, talking with people about situations where they felt like they were discriminated against either because of race or because of sex or because of something that they couldn't quite put their finger on, but they knew it wasn't right and how they dealt with that. And there are a couple of different ways that you can deal with that. Um, and I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. So for example, uh, you know, so the, the one person that I mentioned earlier who is now CEO in Metric Stream, uh, while she was at IBM, she wanted to move up in the company. She had her eye on a specific promotion. She wanted to be head over in a, a larger sort of region in the company. And she was really a top performer where she was. She had in her career plan that she wanted to do it by a specific age. And she was getting close to that time and she wasn't moving. Now she had told her supervisors that she wanted to move up, which is part of the plan. You need to let other people know. You just can't keep it to yourself, right? Uh, but for some reason, it just wasn't happening. And so when she saw that it wasn't happening and that she probably wouldn't hit the time limitation that she had put on herself, she decided that, well, maybe I should go outside of this organization because if they're not going to get me there by the time that I want to, I bet you I can find somebody else who can. And so ultimately she did that. She got another job offer. She came back to let them know and they were shocked and appalled and were very concerned that they would lose one of their top performers. Come to find out what happened was the person who uh, she was telling that she was willing to move to a bigger market, that she wanted to move to a bigger market, wasn't letting her ambitions known to his higher ups. And so when she sort of uh, deconstructed that situation, she was saying, I don't know whether or not it was because I was black. I don't know whether or not it was because I was a woman. I don't know whether or not it was because I was a top performer and he just didn't want to lose me on his team. It could have been any one of those things, right? She doesn't know. But the bottom line is, if she wouldn't have been willing to come back and say, I had this other opportunity, put up or shut up, then she might have been stuck there for God knows how long. And so once they knew that she was about to leave and they were about to lose one of her top perform their top performers, she got that promotion pretty immediately. You know, there's another example of another woman in the book who um, actually sued her university for discrimination, won the case, and then was so bold as to continue to work there. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. you know, depending <laughs> upon how, <laughs> exactly. Um, there are other examples in the book with, a woman, for example, who suggested that uh, this, this sister works at Nike, um, sales director at Nike. 
her situation was that, you know, when she finds uh, that she is in uncomfortable situations where she feels as if she's been treated unfairly, what she does is she just reaches out to her network, reaches out to her mentors, reaches out to her sponsors and says, and, and describes the situation to them and gets their perspective on how to best deal with it within that company. So the point is there are various different ways that you can deal with this from the you know most extreme for the most egregious things. Obviously, the laws are there for a reason in terms of the EEOC. Uh, you can file a lawsuit at the most extreme end. Uh, you can, at the other end of the spectrum, at the least extreme end, just get advice from other people within the company who may have had similar experiences and get from their uh, experiences how to navigate that situation in such a way that you can overcome the situation without hurting your professional future. And in the middle of those two extremes, I think, uh, is the tact of looking outside of that organization and seeing what other opportunities are out there. Because sometimes it may be necessary to leave the organization that you're in right now to ultimately where you get where you want to go in the future. Right, that makes sense. It makes sense a lot. And so, uh, viewers, I hope you're taking notes because Dr. Avis is sharing some really good stuff in reference to you know how how to deal with that. And again, it's having those sponsors, those mentors, that village of people that you can go to that you can bounce these things off of and get their perspective that can help you to get more clear about you know what direction you need to go in or what what decisions you need to make uh, when it comes to you know what you feel like is next, what's your next course of action for what challenge you may have. Mm -hmm. So let's go to the next one, which is perspectives on how to attract key mentors and sponsors sponsors that are critical to career success. This is a very good one because a lot of people are not really sure how to identify someone in their workplace. Yeah. Um, and I think we're not, and we're not just talking about having someone outside. We're talking, talking about actually in the workplace, mm -hmm. um, someone that they feel like they can. How can they identify someone that they feel like could be trustworthy and honest uh, and with mm -hmm. feedback and um, there, you know, has a strong sense of communication. So, kind of, what what should they look for? Well, a couple of different things. One of the things that you can do, quite frankly, is to talk to some of your peers uh, in your organization, find out who they work with, get a sense of who within the organization is a mover and a shaker. Who do you want to develop a relationship with, given what you see in terms of their impact on the organization? You want to connect with someone who you can learn from, someone who is at that next level, someone who's very successful, someone who you want to emulate. So if you find someone that you say, okay, in X number of years, I want to be doing something very similar to what that person is doing, then that's a good person that you might want to target as someone you might want to have a mentoring relationship with. Now, um, the people that I interviewed in my book had very, had, some of them had different perspectives on how would be the best way to start a relationship like that. I think in my discussions with my clients and other people, that seems to be sort of the biggest challenge that people face is exactly how do you approach, how do you get a mentor to say yes? Um, and it's twofold. On the one hand, you know, and there are situations where it might be appropriate just to ask someone, would you like to mentor me? Uh, however, uh, it's my experience and I think most people it's experience that that probably is not the most successful methodology to use because, you know, if you're selecting someone to mentor you, more, normally you're selecting them because of what I just said. There's someone who's a mover and a shaker. There's someone who's very successful. And people who are like that are very, very busy. They don't have a lot of time. And they oftentimes already have mentors and put a lot into their mentoring relationships, just like they put a lot into the rest of their professional life. So because they understand the level of commitment there, uh, they are oftentimes very hesitant to take on new mentors. But that doesn't mean that you can't form a mentoring relationship with them. You just have to be more strategic about how you develop that relationship, right? So the way that you do that is you might just ask them, you know, well, I have this particular situation happening. What would you suggest that I do? It could just be one question. You could ask it via email. You can ask them in person. Listen to what they say. And here's the key part. Then you got to do it. You have to yeah. implement. <laughs> After you implement, then you go back to them. That's the other key part. Let them know that you implemented it. Let them know what the outcome was. More than likely, the outcome is going to be positive. You're going to then thank them for what happened. So it, you'll begin to, they'll begin to see, hey, she actually did it and it worked out well. Let a couple of more, you know, months or so go by and then ask them their perspective on another issue. Implement, 
have an outcome, report back to them what happens. Now, this is very important because a lot of the people that I spoke to mentioned that one of their pet peeves is that for those folks that they do take the time to give advice to, most people never get back to them, never take the time to get back to them. And so if you're getting back to them consistently and letting them know that what you're implementing is working and it's working successfully, number one, you're standing out from the crowd already because most people don't do that. Number two, if you're implementing the work and it's working out to your benefit, that probably means that you're receiving professional benefits because of it. You're now becoming the star in the organization. And every mentor wants to be known as being someone who's connected to this protege that's the new up and coming star. So now the, 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 you know, the script is gonna be flipped, so to speak. Now they're gonna want to mentor you. Now they're gonna invite you into the... That's the kind of way that you can sort of trick them, it's bad to say it like that, but you're gonna influence them to be your mentor better instead of you asking them to be your mentor. And so it's a way to, to garner that uh, mentor entering relationship a little bit more quickly and effectively, and it's going to produce stronger ties, and they're going to really be there for you for many years ahead if you are able to prove to them from the beginning that you listen to what they say, that you implement, and that you get back. Then they'll want to take credit for you and say, hey, that's my star. I discovered her uh, you know, a couple of months ago. But it's, it's strategic. Yeah, <laughs> it's, all, exactly. it's all strategic, you know. I love it. I think I, yeah. I love it. I think it's a, a great a great style to do that. So, question based on that, um, in terms of um, leadership, mm -hmm. you know, describe a leadership mindset. What should a, a what type of leadership mindset should a black woman have? Mm. So the first part of the leadership mindset, first of all, is just knowing that you have the ability within you to lead, that, that, that sort of base confidence, that self-confidence that you can achieve is, is absolutely critical. A leader does not, um, you know, you can't approach situations with doubt. Uh, you know, do your due diligence, figure out uh, what's the best strategy, but approach your situations with confidence. Another mindset uh, characteristics that leaders typically have is they are just very, very dedicated to the work. I mean, they are very hard workers. They're not afraid of being the first one there, the last one to leave. They're not afraid of putting in that, that time that become, that's necessary to build their skills. Uh, another, another sort of key leadership mindset of a lot of the people that I spoke to in this, uh, in this book uh, is that they believe that they could learn something that may not be within their skill set today, but they believed in their ability to acquire a new skill set if needed for a new situation. So many people sometimes shirk away from opportunities because they don't believe that they have every single set of skills and uh, assets that they need to be able to perform. But what my leaders in this book showed over and over again is that they had something that's called a growth mindset. And basically that means that these are people who believe that what they don't know today, they are, they are confident that they have the ability to acquire what they need to move forward. Instead of cutting off opportunity and saying, well, I only know how to do X, Y, Z, so I'm only going to feel comfortable doing X, Y, Z. They are saying, well, if a great opportunity comes over here and I need to know how to do F, then I'm going to figure, I'm, I'm going to put myself in that situation and I'm going to learn how to do F and I'm going to do it well until they actually make that happen. So you have to believe not only in your, in your ability to perform today, you also have to believe in your ability to acquire what's necessary for you to be able to perform tomorrow in expanded ways. Oh, I love that. I absolutely love that. And so, and some, and some people have that innate ability to know that about yeah. themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And then some absolutely. people just need to be able to walk through certain experiences to discover that they have the ability. Absolutely. And so that is powerful. Oh my God, that is so powerful. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 we got to talk about that again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so there, there are whole psychologists call this the difference here is between what's called a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. So those people, and it is true that it is part of a personality trait. I mean, some of us yeah. are born with a very fixed mindset and we only feel comfortable doing those things that come to us naturally. And when we are post, um, when we're put in situations where we have to do something that is outside our natural area of brilliance, we feel very uncomfortable and we 
tend to avoid those situations. So that those areas that we're very good at are only those things that we have the natural inclination for. And so our abilities are very sort of narrow as a result. Then there are other people that have this growth mindset where they find, they find that they're excited by learning new things. They're excited by difficult things. They're excited by something they can't quite figure out. And it's, 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 it's growing that ability that's something that's interesting to them. They don't recall from it. They sort of uh, are attracted by it. And so it's these people that are, have that sort of growth mindset, this base confidence that they can acquire this new skill that tend to do better as leaders. The good thing, though, is that even if you're born with a fixed mindset, you can expand into a growth mindset by sort of faking it until you make it, I guess is a bad way, a simplified way of saying it. But the bottom line is you have to force yourself to grow in that direction. You have to say to yourself, okay, I know that this is what the reality is, that maybe I do have a fixed mindset, but if I can just um, put in enough work, put in enough practice, put in enough repetitions, read enough books, whatever is necessary for you to be able to master that new skill, once you begin to, to, to prove to yourself that you can expand your levels of expertise and you're able to do that over and over again, you will eventually be able to expand your mind such that you will become a growth mindset person because you've proven to yourself over and over again that you can make it happen. So don't you think that this can count for people who um, desire to be something and they have this feeling they 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 kind of you know they desire to 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 become something or do something and move to in that, in that direction they may mm -hmm. not be there just yet mm -hmm. but they have that innate feeling or that and they they feel like they have the capability to do that i would say that probably that also will fall under that as well Absolutely. because they have, they have a desire to do that and it reminds me of something that happened to me um Oh my goodness! Probably, I'm saying the year 2000, probably, and it was a friend of mine, and we were having this conversation, and I was asking her why was she doing what she was doing about something, and she says, "Well, you know, why are you asking me that? You know, at least I'm not running around thinking I'm, you know, more than what I am." And then when I looked at her, I thought, "Wow, you really said that to me after all these years of friendship." I said, "Why can't it be that I'm just being who I am, but right. I want more of myself?" Right. And so, but, but and so sometimes it's what it is. And when you have people who look at it that way of saying, well, she's trying to be more than what she is. No, she really is trying to be who she's inside. She's trying to become who she is from the inside. Absolutely. It's, you know, and so I think that that's, you know, viewers, if you feel that way, it's all, it's just something within you that's wanting to come out and you just have to discover how to make that happen. So Absolutely. that powerful too. That was powerful too. Absolutely. I mean, I work with clients who, particularly those who are interested in what I call career reinvention, they're interested in moving into a different field. And it requires that you get comfortable with the uncomfortable because you are going to need to acquire new skills, acquire new abilities, uh, learn new things uh, when you make that shift. And so you have to understand that you are blossoming. You know, I, I personally believe that uh, throughout our lives, we're kind of like a, a budding flower, right? We, we start with it like a bud, a very tight bud, but through years and experiences and travel, travels and our, we grow, right? We have new abilities that come to the fore. We have new experiences. Uh, we, we develop new skills. And we can then use those experiences, those new, those new skills in new directions in terms of our careers. And so as we begin to know that we want to move in a different direction, whether it be for a new career, whether it means in terms of ascending up into leadership, know that you can draw on all those new skills, those abilities, those experiences that you've developed over the years to start to push you into an entirely new arena. And so would you and recommend, so would you recommend I, I talk about trusting your instinct. Mm -hmm. So do you think that's a good to do? Oh, absolutely. I think your gut's there for a reason. Trust your gut. <laughs> Trust your gut. I always say that. So I know we've got about six minutes or so left, but one thing I wanted to just mention, and I know that we don't have to talk about it, but I just have to mention it because it's in the book, chapter four, about cracking the corporate code. And I know oh, yeah. that I know that you it sounds like you kind of shared a little bit of that when we we're talking about um, you know, how they can you, you know, really work with the mentor or, you know, they're not necessarily the mentor, but the piece about um, you know, going and the benefits of you know why they need to be going to you know the um, you know after hours events and the purposes oh, of yeah. that. Um, so yeah. I just have to say, just cracking the corporate code, and I'm not going to say anything about that chapter, but that chapter is fantastic, you guys. <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> 
know, I mean, if you want to learn about leadership ambitions, I mean, you if you get the book, Chapter Four, Cracking the Purple Code. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sis. <laughs> oh, those some bad sisters in that chapter. Those some bad sisters in that chapter. I got sisters from Bloomberg, from IBM, from I Nike. I don't even want to give it away. Get the book. That's all I'm going to say. Yes. Crack the corporate code. It's like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Two thumbs up. Absolutely. That. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the last one I want to cover um, is guidance on how to design and build a holistic life you love. And I know this is hugely important um, is because it's not all just about climbing that ladder of success, yeah. but about the holistic piece. So share, share with our viewers what you mean by that holistically. And what does that mean for us as black women? How should we go about creating a holistic life? Yeah. So the reason why I focus on that is because I believe really as um, working women and as black women in particular, because we have so much responsibility, you know, where we're more likely to be single parents. If we're not, we're more likely to contribute a higher proportion of the household income is, is dependent upon our earning power. So we're very critical to our families and that puts a lot of pressure on us. And because of the level of pressure that it puts on us to produce financially, we put a lot of time and attention into our careers. We invest thousands of dollars into our education. We invest God knows how many hours into not only our education, but our experiences to get to where we are. And so we put a lot of our lives into creating our careers. But oftentimes, because we focus so much in that area, we don't put that same sort of level of time and attention into the rest of our lives, into our private lives, into our home lives. In fact, sometimes we expect that just to just happen, you know, just for it to sort of come together. And the, the main point that I, I, I emphasize in the book is that just as you have to be intentional about your professional life, you also have to be intentional about your personal life for it to be able to develop into what you want it to be. Just as you want to design a professional life in the, in the image of what you ultimately want to achieve, I think the same needs to be done with your personal life. If you know you want uh, children, then you need to be very intentional about how that's going to happen, how you're going to be able to spend the time that you want. If you know that you want a good relationship, you need to have be very intentional about what you're going to do to find, develop, maintain that relationship. You know, those types of things don't just happen. It takes intentionality. And so what I'm what I'm advocating for is to women to give themselves permission to integrate their lives in a way uh, that they will produce a holistic life that they want, the holistic life that they want, that they want to design. Not what other people say is quote unquote the norm. What do you want your holistic life to be? And then be very intentional about creating it. And don't forget to have time for you because your health is very important too. Absolutely. Obviously. That is so true. <laughs> we definitely have to focus on that more. So here's some takeaways that you guys I wanted to that I just kind of wrote down as we were going along just a couple of these um, that to share from tonight's conversation with um, with Dr. Avis. And the first one I think, which is the one that stuck with me the most, which is communicate with power. You know, Absolutely. learning how to learning how to do that. So um, write that down, viewers. You know, learn how to communicate with power. Whether that means managing your emotions, your body language, your facial expressions. Um, you know, learning how to do that and, and own it. You know, own own your power when it comes to how you communicate with your peers and leadership and and all of that. And then the next one, self promote. Remember to do that. We don't do that as often as we should, right, hey, Doctor Avis? In that terms is so of right getting recognized for the, the work that we do, the hard work that we do for you. So those of you who are going to work and, and, and working, uh, working your butts off and then uh, thinking that's enough, it's not, you know. Find someone that can help to self -pro help you promote and be recognized for the work that you're doing. So mm -hmm. remember to self-promote. Self and then remember the benefits of, you know, benefits of, you know, getting together with your coworkers after hours. You know, if they, say, if they want to go to happy hour, like Dr. Davis said, go. You'll be surprised what you find out after a couple of cocktails, martini, a couple of beers, right. whatever. <laughs> you get them all sauced up and there's no telling what you'll find out. <laughs> no telling. So, it's, so think about this. So think about it. Just don't go to the, to the, to, you know, the happy hour or, you know, whatever the after hours have been and say, I'm just going to sit here with my glass of wine and be like, hee, hee, hee. No, conversate and, and make them feel comfortable enough to talk to you because that's how you're going to find out. So I think that was a really key highlight moment for tonight was talking about the benefits of, and the importance of 
what you can find out um, from uh, being in those and you know doing the after hour stuff. And then making sure that you're asking about, um, you know, making sure you're picking a, a mentor or a um, sponsor, someone that's within the organization that's going to be, that can be very pivotal um, spokesperson for you. And I know you guys have probably heard this before, but just being strategic about how you go about doing this. So some of those, those are some of my takeaways uh, mm -hmm. from tonight that I just wanted to recap for um for tonight's conversation and there's so much more in this book this book is fantastic you guys so i have to say if you do not have this book you can get it on kindle and you can also get look at the sonya book for you with dr amos <laughs> <laughs> thank you sis i appreciate it <laughs> i'll just sell the book um, for you no, let, me, let me just also let your uh listeners know that if they go to blackwomenlead.com it will it can shoot them over to amazon and kindle but in addition to that they can download a free companion journal that goes with the book. There you go, see, that's it. Right <laughs> that's the Kindle, this is the regular version. <laughs> and Absolutely. with the companion journal, you can work through the, the uh, exercises as you go through the book so that you can implement everything that you're learning in the book. All right, fantastic. So you just found out where you can where you can get her book, and please do. This book has been a, a, an eye opener for me. I love her perspective. I love what she shared uh, with the women in the book, and it definitely can. It definitely will take you to another level once you read this. You will it will raise your level of consciousness about being a black woman in the workplace. It really mm -hmm. will. And so, um, and that really is the, the purpose. I would say, for at least that's what I gathered. You know, Absolutely. it definitely it's a, it's a very empowering book. It really is. So, um, Dr. Amos, please share with our viewers where they can find you on social media. Absolutely. So you can find me on Twitter at Sista, S-I-S-T-A-H, Scholar. You can find me on Facebook at Dr. Avis Jones Dweaver, Avis Jones Dweaver on LinkedIn and on Instagram, The Real Dr. Avis. All right. So there you have it. You can find her on all, all the social media platforms. And again, you guys, we are going to bring her back. Because I think we need to have a whole conversation around cracking that corporate code. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, that in and of itself is I a lot. <laughs> so the, I want to thank everyone for watching our uh, the, our first segment of The Corner Office. Um, this has been fantastic. We're definitely going to have Dr. Avis back again. Um, we are all going right now. We're only going to be doing the corner office segments once a month. We will continue with um, so far with our weekly uh, segments of the um, career conversations. We are taking a, a week off next week, so we can um, so we can kind of revamp and um, do something new with our career conversations. So we will not be around next Wednesday, but we will be back the Wednesday after next with a new special guest on our career conversations. Um, well, any last words or takeaways you want to share with the viewers? Uh, I just wanted to encourage your viewers to know that they have the ability within them to be anything that they want to be. If you have a desire in your heart to be at a specific level at your job or to move over into a new job or to start your own business, I personally believe that that desire is there for a reason. You just need to equip yourself with the information and don't, but don't study it forever. Implement and you'll get there. You know what? That's right. That's going to lead into the quote that I always share with everyone, which is the life God gave you is larger than the life you've been living, which means that God, God gives us all specific strengths and gifts. And it's our job to discover what those are and use those to work in our purpose. Mm -hmm. So remember that. Absolutely. It's Absolutely. so important. So uh, for those of you who are new to BCWM, please become a member. You can join us at bcwnetwork.com and go to become a member. And for those of you who are new, we are offering a 50% discount off the membership. Just put in the, the, the uh, access code of BCWN, 50% off, and become a, new, become a new member of our family. So we would appreciate that if you would join. For those of you who are currently members, keep tuning in. We've got some fantastic things that we're going to be doing with BCWN moving forward, some new products that we're going to be launching. Um, and also, too, I'm so excited about some of the um, additional guests that we're going to be having for our corner office. And we're definitely going to schedule and get on um, uh, Dr. Ava's books to bring her back. Awesome. <laughs> and like, like fast. So I want to thank <laughs> you for turning in. Tuning, I mean, for tuning in for tonight's um, first segment of the Corner Office, and um, please share your comments, any aha moments that you've had with tonight's um, conversation. Um, put it on our Twitter, on our Facebook page at BCW Network. The handle is same across all of our social media, and share with us what your thoughts and your opinions were about tonight's um, first segment of the Corner Office. Until next time, you guys have a great rest of your work week, and we will talk to you soon. Doc Davis, hang on. 
All righty. Bye. Bye, guys.